Right, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, let's settle down. Uh, we're going to run for exactly an hour. And uh, I should explain uh, why we've moved it from the larger room into this slightly smaller room. It's after uh, the death uh, of uh, Mr. Monjal from the he founder of Hero. And uh, the, p the prayer gathering, the prayer ceremony is this afternoon. And quite a few uh, members uh, of the gathering have left for that. So we thought it'd be much better if we met in a slightly more confined space so we didn't feel as if we were rattling around in a much larger room. So um, thank you very much indeed for your understanding. This is now on the record, which is why we have cameras here, and part of this is going out live as well uh, in uh, many parts of the world and certainly across India. This is what next and how fast. The challenge for you is to help us define that based on what we've been discussing, what you've been discussing in various groups since uh, 9.30 this morning. And uh, the challenge is to do that in the next 59 minutes. Uh, is there frustration? Is there optimism? Uh, how fast can things go? Uh, what level of optimism do you have? Let me remind you, in case some of you were not here, Finance Minister, uh, Mr. Jetley, said right at the beginning of the day, he uh, uh, has a reasonable sense of satisfaction and he's had a few pleasant experiences, which um, for a politician is quite a positive statement. Uh, and then he went on with a number of the details of uh, many of the things that uh, you were all raising. Now, to make this a little more lively, I've got a new microphone system here. It's called a catch box, which means I can toss it to people. So the aim for you is to catch it. And if you catch it, you then get the chance to speak. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, is to make sure that we have an idea of what has been said in each of the different uh, groups today. So each of uh, the five groups have uh, nominated a rapporteur, the chair, in fact, uh, to just give us a sense over the next uh, hour of what was uh, said. And I'd like you to feel you can use uh, that table, the white bit in the middle. You can write on it with a black pen, please. And then if you are getting frustrated, you can write it up there. Be, don't be, you need to be polite and not rude, because it will be visible. But it gives me an idea of anything that you might want to say uh, over the next hour. We'll call it a, a doodle pad uh, for, some, for want of something better. So I want feedback uh, and comment. We have two senior figures here who are going to um, pass judgment on what you say and also add their perspectives to uh, what their view is on these critical issues that have been raised during this policy day. Uh, first of all, we have Nitin Gadkari, who is Minister of Road, Shipping uh, and Transport <coughs> and Highways, an enormous portfolio minister. Thanks for joining us. And N.K. Singh, who's a senior member of the BJP uh, and an analyst of economic policy. They'll be providing their views uh, on all of this uh, shortly. Uh, I think one of, the th one of the phrases I'm taking away from this is the phrase we had from uh, Minister Goyal, public-private people partnership, PPPP. So something is, is developing here which is really important to understand about the way forward for many of these issues. That's the structure. That's what we're going to try and achieve. I'd like to uh, first uh, invite Mr. Ramadore to give uh, his reflections of, of what has been said. And remember, some of what you've heard was off the record. So you'll have to be a little discreet. You can use this if you like. Sitting there? You can stand here if you like, yes. OK, I prefer. Good. Well, good evening, everyone. I think as part of the Global Advisory Council of India, which I'm chairing, it has been an enormous learning experience. More importantly, in terms of the interdisciplinary nature of the group that we got together, and we addressed a couple of issues. One with regard to the skilling as an objective for outcomes. All along, we have been looking at uh, input measures with regard to the number of people that have been enrolled. But suddenly, we have been pushing for an outcome measure where at the end of the day, either you create entrepreneurs who create employment or you create jobs which are going to be very, very necessary. Couple of things which are going to hit us are one is disruptions. Second is with regard to the pace of change, the changes in technology, and the future of jobs need to be defined. If we have to fold the current training, scaling, scaling, and the vocational education as a possibility or a necessity 
to make sure that the future jobs are there with the right kind of skills if India has to be competing in the world and also to address its demographic profile very clearly. <laughs> we did look at some of the learnings as part of the groups. How do we bring in the apprenticeship program more effective? How do you learn from some of the German models? And how do you look at, learn and earn together at the same time so that the employers benefit, the individuals benefit, and the educational institutions benefit in this whole journey? Second thing on the financial inclusion was again a very, very good learning experience, starting from the Jandan Yojana, but that's just a starting point. And how do you build on that to empower the population at large so that no citizen is left out? Some of the platforms that are being created, both with the government support and the private providers that are going to be a part of that, is going to be a revolution where we will witness certain outcomes. Every day, every year, and at the end of the five years or 10 years, we will see how an inclusive India with the financial inclusion takes place. I think the Smart City Initiative, as I learned, was extremely useful with regard to the kind of investment that are going, but more importantly, the linkages with regard to the employment itself and the skills. The contract manufacturing or the manufacturing as a base for India, but how do we develop the ancillary industries because they are the engine of employment and growth? How do you link that to the value chain totally and it's a global supply chain and we need to be connected to the global supply chain. These were the learnings that I think it was the most productive experience, but a digital India, connected India, and a skilled India, and a manufacturing out of here for a global connect were some of the themes which we articulated. That's what I learned during the course of the days. Thank you very much. Uh, really very helpful. Let's drill down a little bit into each of the five areas. And uh, let me go to Vandana, uh, first of all, uh, to ask about human capital and skills, Vandana. Um, let me toss this to you. Hope you can catch it. There, well, she's... <laughs> it does work. Right, Vandana, um, welcome. Uh, give us a couple of minutes of what you have learned and what you uh, learned from particularly the the session that you uh, chaired on human skills. And then anyone else come in, please, because we're going to go through these one after the other. How uh, sensitive That is works. This? Yeah, OK. So the first uh, lesson that came out of our group is stop depending on the government and stop waiting on the government to act. Um, we talked about uh, whether it's employment skills, whether it's bringing talent to market, whether it's fostering entrepreneurship. The, it's not necessary to wait for the conditions in the government to change. Um, if you look at what IKEA did in Sweden, um, they went to the government, the government wasn't ready to act, um, they did it on their own, and then the government took notice. So each person in this room can act, and that momentum that we gain um, uh, around entrepreneurship and employment will actually get government buy-in along the way. The second is entrepreneurial opportunities. How do we actually create them for people? So starting at the education level, how do we integrate entrepreneurial skills into our education system? Then later on, how do we actually create a market for entrepreneurs in terms of giving them access to capital and talent? Um, how do we help them scale up or shut down? Uh, the third is connecting the dots between education, skills, and employment. That starts at the ground level. How much do each of us know, whether we're an educator or um, a business leader, um, what's happening at each stage along the way, and how do we refine what we're doing um, to actually see that people are becoming employ employable and productive at the end of this chain. And finally, there was a plug for the Holistic Skills Framework Pilot in Kota. Anyone is interested in going to Kota, then they're inviting you to, uh, to come into that region to, start, um, to partner with them to start ITIs or spe sector-specific centers of excellence. So I think that's but Anna Goyal from the Akancha Foundation, thank you very much indeed. We'll move oh, on to agriculture shortly. Does anyone want to? You can throw it back to yeah. me if you want. Yeah, <laughs> I'll catch. Thank you. Um, uh, this is not cricket, I should tell you. Um, who would like to come in? Anyone want to add anything about the importance of human capital and skills and the urgency that they feel? Remember, we're talking about uh, what next and how fast, the speed at which this is necessary. Is it work or jobs? Anyone want to come in immediately? I know a lot of you contributed earlier, but anyone want to come in? Let me go to the minister. Minister, when you hear that kind of message from here, what is your thought about how much of this really can be achieved, given the enormity of one million new uh, Indians coming onto the job market every month? I feel that uh, this is the time for the country. 
that we have to understand the strength and weaknesses. The strength is raw material is available. At the same time, manpower is available. And particularly, what I want to suggest to you that the rural sector and agriculture sector is most important because the maximum poverty, unemployment we are facing in agriculture. And by taking using the technology, appropriate technology, we can also create good employment potential in the rural area and agriculture. I feel that the conversion of waste into wealth is the philosophy and where we have got a lot of biomass. I am thinking on one line that from dry straw, wheat straw, cotton straw, we can make ethanol from that. And from ethanol, we can make bioplastic. And bioplastic is really a good item where the farmers get good rates. Today, ethanol manufacturers, number of manufacturers in India is quite high. So by converting ethanol from corn, from uh, sugar beet, from sugar cane, from the municipal waste, segregate the glass, metal and plastic, then we can convert into ethanol. A lot of technology is available in the world, particularly in the USA. So this is the time that we should concentrate on the agriculture sector. The third important thing is, we are giving subsidy for urea for 55,000 crores. We have 30 factories and out of which only four factories, they are making urea from naphtha and 26 from natural gas. And now the in China and many countries, they are making urea from coal. Now first time, our government allotted one coal mine for manufacturing urea from coal. So now this is a sector where tremendous requirement is there. It is import substitute and we can reduce the cost of urea, which presently is market is 1400 rupees per bag. It can go to five to 600 rupees and we can save the subsidy of 55,000 crores. We are giving it to the factories. So these are the innovations and the new technology, particularly we can use it for the rural and agriculture sector. As far as the skill development is concerned in my, particularly my ministry, my planning is for next uh, five years, construction of, road construction of five lakhs crores. It's a big amount, but I have got a credential that what I say, always I complete it. Thank you. So, well, uh, so my, my suggestion is inland waterways, uh, road infrastructure, <coughs> these are the two sectors where maximum capital investment probably uh, we are expecting maximum capital investment in this sector the shipping ports and i will request you there is a lot of opportunity for the employment potential but the skill specific skill we need where we need to train the manpower in that sector so that can be also a good sector the atmosphere in the country is totally pro development and we want to encourage the entrepreneurship between the industry and between the small people also by financing them by Mudra Bank. At the same time, I will request you, if you can decentralize these efforts, particularly for the rural and agriculture field, it will be more, use, more useful for the country. Right, we'll come on to agriculture shortly as the next uh, session uh, section. Uh, N.K. Singh, um, the issue is surely jobs, work, the gig economy, how to monetize it, what the expectations are of the next generation? Well, I think that uh, Goyle had summed up exceedingly well of looking at the convergent trinity of uh, education, skill, and employment. In fact, if you have really a symmetry between this trinity of education, skill, and employment with the other trinity of what is also a government's favorite program of uh, the jam, which is using basically mobile phone, telephony, and technology for purposes, then the convergence between the trinity which you have explained and the trinity of jam should bring about virtuous multiplier circles in bringing about and fostering skill-based employment. But the critical issue there well, is how to change the pedagogy in our education system which will enable the fostering of skills, which will lead to the kind of employment for which there are emerging opportunities. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I was having a conversation with Venkat. Where are you, Venkat, in the room? Uh, 
over there. Yeah, because you were making a point uh, which you wanted to raise here uh, about whether the model and the thinking is actually appropriate now uh, for the kind of challenge that India now faces. And I should tell you, there is one comment here. The direction is more important than the speed, than fast. Good evening, everyone. Just explain and uh, introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, my name is Venkat. I represent uh, the organization Junior Achievement. In short, we are the largest school around the world, reaching out to 10 million students. But there's a perspective I wish to share. Now, we all have seen different reports from different entities about the growth models and where we can reach. Let's say, for sake of this discussion, that today a $2 trillion economy that India is becomes a $12 trillion economy, let's say, or whatever be the period of time. Now, let's look at another economy, which is a $12 trillion today, which is US. Now, US attained this, whatever the industries, whatever be the conversion process, US attained a $12 trillion with a population which is less than India's workforce today. Whatever processes, whatever industries that we may choose for going forward for this growth, definitely those technologies will be much better than what US has because we have a time gap over here. But you're also making the point about the aspiration and reality yes. gap. So there are two things. For the next generation. <laughs> There is a tearing aspiration for people to pick up jobs, and that particular aspiration is all like, I need it yesterday. The second is, even if we were to attain this particular growth, we may have wealth to take care of our people, but that particular wealth may not necessarily translate into certain jobs which can be given to people so that they can sh take part in that particular wealth creation. So we may have to think of a plan B of how do we reach out wealth to people. Is that the hypothesis that I wish to share? All right, well, let me pick up on that, Minister, very quickly about whether actually your growth model is the correct model. In other words, whether it's hung up by the old ways of thinking as opposed to the necessi necessity of very significant and more radical ways of thinking. I feel that the communist and socialist model, as per the results of the models, you know better. I don't want to make any comments on it. But basic, our emphasis on in our economic policies is how we can eradicate the poverty, how we can increase the employment potential, how we can increase the agriculture growth rate. That Gao, Garib, Majdur and Kisan, the rural development and agriculture growth is most important. And I am giving you one example. The BJP rule state Madhya Pradesh, the agriculture growth is rate is 23%. And in Gujarat, it is 14%. I am from Maharashtra, it is one of the progressive states, but our agriculture growth rate is minus. So now this is the time, by increasing irrigation, how we can be giving, creating more employment potential in the rural area, <coughs> in the tribal area. And there are a lot of technology innovations are available where we can make it the employment available into the tribal, rural, and agriculture sector. So my request is the maximum 62 to 64 percent of the population is in the rural area. And now you are absolutely correct about all the industry sector, the manufacturing sector, the skill development. This is the correct line. I, have, I don't have any resolution about it. But my feeling is, this is a field where we can use technology, latest technology, and where we can more employment potential, which is in the interest of the country. So the approach of our prime minister and our economic policy is how we can generate more employment potential. And the result is very clear. When uh, Pradhan Mantri ji taken charge as a prime minister, our GDP was 4.25%, and today it is 7.50. So now, the, basically, it is very important for service sector, or manufacturing sector, it's very important to concentrate on it to create more jobs. But my request is we should think about out of box and using the technology and innovation in particular rural area and agriculture area. My feeling is there is a lot of potential, economic viability is available and we can take the technology up to that level. It can be a great socio-economic transformation for the country. Thank you. Out of the box, N.K. Singh, but that other question about the aspiration and reality gap, particularly with the next generation who have big expectations, particularly of this government. Coming back to that question, how fast can this really be achieved? Well, I think that the minister is right, that uh, clearly even though the contribution of agriculture to India's GDP has uh, progressively come down to what is now 12%, Nonetheless, about 60% of Indians still derive livelihood from agriculture. Therefore, unless you create agro and agro-based activities not directly related to agriculture, but agriculture-related employment activity, that's the case where you have multiplier gains on employment. I think that we all very sharp question on aspirational India. I think that 
that is one of the centerpieces of the Prime Minister's program, the spread of digital India. And as we see the expectation of a digital India, when you wire up in terms of fiber, uh, fiber optical cables, it is a centerpiece of the Prime Minister's program to proceed on this entire thing of jam. The centerpiece of the jam is to target government benefits through mobile telephony and internet in improving health and educational <coughs> outcomes in a very tangible way. Right. Well, let's now move on immediately with agriculture, the second of the five groups, to Siraj Chowdhury, who's uh, chairman of uh, Cargill here in India. Uh, you have the microphone, and uh, we'd like to know what was discussed and what kind of recommendations came out of your agriculture group. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that I had mentioned in my discussion, uh, which we had uh, just post-lunch, was that Indian agriculture historically has been, uh, a, you know, been a combination of God, government, and the farmer, where uh, essentially the Indian farmer has been having faith in God, trust in the government, and commitment in his own toil. That model, uh, suddenly over the last few years, seems to have gone bad, with uh, God's really looking the other way. I mean, the last few years have not been the best uh, in terms of the climatic support that we need for Indian agriculture, which is heavily dependent on uh, the natural uh, elements for its success. Government over the years, so it's not to say this year, last year, very often the government of the day gets the flag for what's not happening, but it's really over the years. I think our approach has been more about uh, subsidies. It's been more about uh, addressing short-term problems rather than investing in agriculture. Uh, we are now seeing uh, the solution that uh, the industry sees is that introducing a new element into this tripartite relationship that has historically existed, which is really the industry. Uh, now, that's been something which has actually deliberately been kept away in the past because trade was supposed to be bad uh, for agriculture. There was large mistrust between the farmer and uh, the government versus uh, the trade. And I think industry coming in is probably the next step. And some of that has been made uh, possible through some of very uh, good initiatives that have been taken, particularly in the state of Maharashtra, where there are live examples of almost 30 plus uh, uh, private public partnerships which have worked to increase farm incomes, improve technology. Uh, I would take one more uh, sort of point here, which is that we talk about, and the Honorable Minister mentioned, that there is a lot of innovation happening in the, face of, uh, in the uh, space of food and agriculture. I think what is holding it back is the slow uh, rate of change that is happening in the policy framework. So we have a lot of uh, innovation happening around the world, which we can very easily bring into the country. But the regulatory framework, whether it's uh, the APMC laws, the stock control orders, the foreign, uh, foreign forward market commissions, uh, those changes which are required in the regulatory frameworks are not keeping pace. Or the food safety laws and you know, new product development there, uh, they are not keeping pace with the change that is happening in the industry. So I think there needs to be greater linkage uh, uh, between the industry and the farmer, and the government uh, has to play the bridge. Uh, between uh, the farmer and the industry. And that's what we've decided in our sort of uh, deliberations today, that uh, as a group, we need to come together, industry comprising of all the stakeholders from organizations which are part of, I would say, the pre, uh, you know, sowing phase to the post-harvest and the buying, uh, the organizations which procure from the farmers, need to come together as a group uh, and work closely with the government. We, and maybe, the, and that's where the role of the government becomes important, that they need to see us as genuine stakeholders in the interest of the farmers and, uh, and want, uh, you know, invite us and we need to be, beef up our uh, credential. Beef up is not the, probably the right word in these, uh, this environment, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, we need to uh, strengthen our efforts uh, to be considered capable and reliable to be uh, seen as uh, credible advisors uh, to the government. Right, thank you very much indeed. Now, look, I've got to look on my side here. There's a comment, farmers are poor and they get all the benefits. How can we sustain this? The policy has failed. Um, uh, aspiration is to earn more, but missing uh, agency to earn more, an agency to earn more. In other words, there's a degree of um, skepticism here. Does anyone want to come in on agriculture? Uh, I would uh, like to invite Ajay, who actually represents Please do, yes. the farmers, I think, uh, best from the hospital. And by the way, once you've put a, an entry on your board, do wipe it off, because we're moving on to other areas as well. And do it in black next time, if you can. So, uh, the Honorable Minister is making the best roads. The Honorable Minister is making the best roads where cars will travel fastest. And, and it's good for infrastructure. But the growth that we are seeing is not equitable to all sections of society. And uh, while other sections of society are progressing much faster, farmers are being left behind. And that's why 
the measurement tools for measuring growth need to be reworked. We need to go back to the drawing board. We are measuring growth in terms of GDP. And as a farmer, I can tell you every time, my tractor has an accident, the GDP of this country goes up. And so we need to go back <laughs> to the drawing board to understand and get better measuring tools. I'm going to put that to you. Anyone else want to come in? Lack of equitable growth there, Minister. Back to the drawing board. When his tractor fails, the, the um, output of the country goes up, as he puts it. Um, now, the issue of a regulatory framework, that underpins all five areas. So let's leave that till a little later. But that particular um, uh, accusation, really, lack of equitable growth. Back to the drawing board on agriculture. The basic problem in agriculture is irrigation. The irrigation in Jharkhand is 5.6%, Maharashtra is 16.8%, Madhya Pradesh 31%, and Gujarat is 36%, and uh, in particular the Haryana, Punjab, UP, UP is 48%. The problem is that the irrigation, the, the land acquired, 80% of land acquired for irrigation, dam and lakes. And 15% of water is going to dam and lake, and 50% water conservation, and 70% going to sea. So the water management, drip irrigation, sprinkler, and irrigation is the key of success. And the other problem is 24-hour power. That is also a big problem. Because in the, in the state government, all transmission distribution companies are in losses. So there is a theory, more generation, more losses, no generation, no losses. So they stop the <coughs> electric supply to the rural area. So we have to change some policy on government level, but we need some research. At the same time, we have surplus of wheat, rice, sugar now. And now we have the shortage of oil seeds. In Rajasthan, with the collaboration of Israeli company, they are making now olive oil. That is a successful experiment. So oil, as far as oil is concerned, uh, we have uh, import of 1 lakh crores. And now particularly the soybean. Now I don't know, but the Kargil people are here. In my area, the soybean production is continuously going to down. I don't know what the reason. So the problem is that somewhere we need good research by which we can increase the production. Uh, today I was in Nagaland. There is a pineapple is available, but no transport system, pre-cooling plant, cold storage, nothing is there. So this pre-cooling plant, cold storage, irradiation, these are the new technology where you can invest the money and it can give also the economic viability at the same time giving employment to the rural and agriculture sector. But the word there was back to the drawing board. In other words, the mindset remains rather old-fashioned compared to the reality now faced in agriculture. Sir, it is the duty of the government to change the mindset. I don't want to blame anybody. Just you wait for some day. It is the strong political will is very important and the clarity in the economic approach. I feel that our government, we will take the decision and we are working on the same system and we will be succeed. It will take some time for that. All right, well, let, let's move to another critical area, infrastructure, to Ajit uh, Gulabchand, um, who uh, uh, is uh, the chair and managing director of the Hindustan Construction Company and also a co-chair of today. Um, maybe you'd like to stand up, actually, so the cameras can see you as well, so at least you're uh, halfway facing the camera. But do, 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 do please um, just highlight <coughs> what you think was discussed today and the kind of urging that there is about what next and how fast? <coughs> well, I think everything that we discussed in the area of infrastructure, cities, has been in the context of this enormous figure of a million or more jobs every month, new jobs to be created. And to be able to put our arms around to how big that figure is, we need to understand that this means about 300 million jobs in the next 20 years. These kids are born here today, and they will come seeking job over this period. And just to get a perspective of what this means, United States of America, the largest economy in the world, employs 135 million people. So when we are looking at 300 million new jobs, what kind of economy are we going to set up in 20 years? America took 600 years to set it up. So it is something that we need to apply our mind. There were, Time is not on our side. These kids are born. They're going to come seeking. So you will need every kind of employment. Now, infrastructure is one such enabler. Both it also gives employment as well as it is a creator of that structure which allows manufacturing, agriculture, logistics sector, all other forms of 
manufacturing, agricultural services sector to perform on the back of the infrastructure. So it's extremely important that we build this infrastructure as fast as possible. And this requires an enormous investment. And I think the minister has already begun. I mean, he hit the road running because as soon as he got, became Minister of Transport and really kick-started the entire transport sector very quickly. It is still far from where it should be, but it has kick-started. So it is important for us to understand and see everything that we are doing in the context of these new kids that will come seeking jobs. In 10 years, the pressure will be so high. And these are not old peasants of yesteryear. These are angry people that can derail the entire future of this country if we don't find them these jobs. And which includes investments to create the jobs and education and skills development to enable them to take those jobs. So I think this is the biggest job. Even in infrastructure, we confront this issue. We put the largest workforce in history without any training. It is time for us to really pay attention so we can get productivity out of this. And this is why the skills program initiated by the government, it sounds very strange that a government should initiate it. Elsewhere in the world, there were guilds that created this issue. In India, also these guilds were, were, were embedded in the caste system. The caste system is, had its own problems, so it is out. But we need to create these guilds so that we can create those employment <laughs> opportunities on one side and the capabilities on the other side. But infrastructure is woefully short of what we need. At the moment, for example, we have surplus power in the country. And that is purely a function, not because it's surplus, because the economy is moving very slowly. The day economy picks up, the shortages of power will be the first thing that we will feel. The roads, as he said, there's huge potential in agriculture, agricultural processed foods, et cetera but isolated because of lack of roads, lack of, lack of communication. What about, so, the, what about the mechanism just for building infrastructure? But it's clear no, there's a financial problem, there's a financing problem. Yes, there is a financial problem, but initially the government will have to kickstart this sector by spending the money themselves. There's no financial problem. The road infrastructure is no, they, no, They're flush with funds, you know. There's no question about financial problems. And I can give you the data. It's not and a second problem is, of financial problems. It is also possible to create new models. They can build the roads, and as soon as they're ready and operational, they can sell them. Ah, yes. And they, that can easily <laughs> raise the money. If NHI decides to raise $100 billion, it is not so difficult for them to raise it. I do not believe finance is directly a problem. It's tapping it, making it work, that is the problem. All right. Thank you very much. Let, well, let's just put those two points to the minister. Woefully short of what we need on infrastructure 18 months into your government, we need a kickstart. In other words, it's missing at the moment. No, I am asking you the question, all of you. Can you tell me a single project where the problems are there? How the long Frank, have we got? Uh, yes, if you can tell me, I can, I can give the answer. <laughs> when I taken charge as a minister, 280 projects that cost 380,000 crores are stuck up. Well, Minister, you asked a question. You asked a question. Can I just check in this audience here? Now you tell me any, any of the project, I will give the answer. You just because put up I your, know that there is no project. There just put you up your hand if you're having problems <laughs> with an infrastructure project. Road project. Road. I'm only talking. I'm responsible for road project. I'm talking about road project. <laughs> Minister, they're all friends of yours because no one's putting up their hands at the moment. <laughs> projects of all those businesses who are not there are stopped. <laughs> No, Piyush Goel today gave an excellent account of the projects in the power sector, which have now to a much better start. They are on the mend. The stranded assets are being dealt with. And I think that if you combine power and roads, they are the two critical components of infrastructure. Nevertheless, Minister, I've got to put what we've just heard, woefully short of what we need and kickstart. The, this is the view of the group that discussed that today, 18 months into your government. If it was not hopefully short, why would you want to go to 30 kilometers? Sir, I, I will give the detailed picture about it. I am frank and fair. Don't hesitate to ask me the question. And I am talking with full confidence, either it is media or the industry. First thing is that our budget is 42,000 crores. 
given by the finance minister to us. In NHI, AAA rating, we can raise 70,000 crores of bonds, tax exempted bonds. But we don't need because it is difficult for us to complete, to expedite the expenditure of our budget. Third thing, 101 project in EPC mode, which are completed, already is with me. I can securitize that project, I get 1,20,000 crores. Even my toll income is 8,000 crores. So I can securitize my income for 15 years, I get 1,40,000 crores. So money is not a problem. I am sorry because Mr. Singh is here. One of the problem is the administrative problem. Fast track decision making process, transparency, <coughs> forest environment ministry, land acquisition and taking the decision and there are a lot of committees. I always say if there is a will, there is a way. And if there is no will, there is only survey, discussion, seminar, committee, subcommittee and research group. The problem in the government is, even I have to went clear, I have to go to three to four committees for that. I am doing it, it's my job. But today, as for the road infrastructure is concerned, now, as per the, there was a problem, I know the problem of every company, I know the, his company's problem and his project. I don't know, but I pursue more than him. I know the more position about his project in what is happening there. And I am pulling him that this is the case, this is a problem. So now presently, land acquisition, forest <coughs> environment clearances, because of new government, we have already solved that problem. Now it is time to build up the capacity in the government system and at the same time to build up the capacity in the contractors. In next 15 days, I am going to tender for 17 hybrid road projects. But I am for this year, we have already started 9 PPP projects, first time. Last year it was only 3. But the problem is that now the bank are comfortable, but now there are a lot of, because of previous experience, bank was very much disturbed. But today it is a good and positive atmosphere. As far as this sector is concerned, I feel that there will be no problem in due course of time. This sector will create more jobs. And as far as my ministry is concerned, I have a target to create 50 lakhs jobs within five years. And the second important thing to create add 2% of GDP into the GDP of the country. But Minister, do you, f do you feel worried that the expectations are out there for you to deliver at a speed and with a, an, a level of achievement? And that's what's expected out there. And that's the perception at the moment is there's still a massive problem. And I've got a quote here Sir, from... it is not a massive problem. I'm from it's Mumbai, not a massive from Maharashtra, problem. he knows it. When I declare Bombay Pune Express Highway 55 Plyavers and Verli Bandras, he is the contractor. I construct all that project. There was an appearance in the mind of the people that how will it happen. But I prove it. In the time period, I complete it. I accept it as a challenge. You record everything. And after next meeting, you ask me. I am confident there will be no problem as far as the speed of the road is concerned. Construction. Now, 30 kilometers per day is our target. Today, our target is 18 kilometers. And when I taken charge of the ministry, it was 2 kilometers. So 30 kilometers before March is my target. I don't know whether it will happen or not. But it's, I am confident that we will complete that. So there are the problems. Problems <coughs> from the system. Problems we need fast track decision making process. If we clear the project, the finance ministry, something created the committee and they start to scrutiny for it. That there is a system <coughs> where to improve it. Then regarding the problems, land acquisition, forest environment clearances, these are the problems. Now already we have solved that problem. Then shifting of utilities, the other thing. Problems are everywhere. What my philosophy is, you should understand there are some people who convert problems into opportunities and there are some people who convert opportunities into the problem. So it is problems we are the minister. It is our duty to solve the problem. And as far as my sector is concerned, even uh, the experience of the contractors, other people, they will definitely, they will give more idea about it. But I am confident that the next year will be the fast moving year and we will definitely create good infrastructure. We'll remember that for next year then, a fast moving year. 100%. All right, next yes. year. Um, N.K. Singh, uh, there's a remark up there, got to break out of the silo thinking and uh, champion uh, systemic leadership. I'm reading it virtually upside down. But this sense, and you're an economist, uh, is enough being done? Is the speed the best achievable at the moment on infrastructure? given the perception out there and that kind of language of the need for kickstart, woefully short of what we need? Well, I think that it has kickstarted already because, as you can see, if the snail space at which roads were being constructed is today currently already catapulted from that figure to 18 kilometers with a target of 30 kilometers by March. 
if the standard assets of 3 lakh crores in the power sector have been now converted into viable projects, then the speed has already gathered momentum. But I think that your question is a more fundamental one. Are we really doing adequate to meet? The target is a shifting target. The dynamics of expectations really en enjoin upon the policy makers to not merely be satisfied with an 8% rate of growth, which you are likely to achieve, but to move that to a double digit number. That's the changing dynamics, that's the changing aspiration, and that's what we have to really reach. All right, I've got to move on at high speed because we've only got, do you want to come in? Did, did you want to come in? Please, over there, yeah. C could you introduce yourself? And I need to toss a microphone to you. Um, I've got to move on at some speed, I'm afraid, because we have two more groups. But take the microphone, catch it, and just yeah. give us your thought on this, please. Yeah, I'm Raghuram from the IAM Ahmedabad. Since you asked about projects, I just wanted maybe you could tell us about two projects. One of them is the Delhi Jaipur, you know, the Gurgaon Jaipur Pink City, uh, which is sort of really, I think it's having its own share of troubles. And also the Vadodara Mumbai uh, Expressway, which will sort of Actually, the Delhi-Jaipur project, when I take a charge as minister, only five flyovers at that time is constructed. The project is financed by IDBA Bank and 13 bank in consortium. The project was collapsed. But today, I just take the already the, by car, I go to Jaipur and I just inspect the project. Uh, 55 flyovers are completed. And before December, end of December, only two flyovers, we will complete all the projects and it will be open. Regarding Badoda Mumbai Express Highway, it is not a delayed project. Ahmedabad to Badoda is completed. It is waiting for my date for inauguration of that project. So within 15 days, I will go there and inaugurate Ahmedabad to Badoda. And Badoda to Mumbai, 65% land acquisition is completed. And I am trying to go for tender before December. But project is not delayed. But before January, we will go for the tender or express highway from Badoza to Mumbai. All right, thank you. Right, let's move on to energy now, but I'm just gonna give you three messages which have been written behind you, Minister. Uh, first of all, road safety, the highest number of deaths on roads. Uh, just written up there, every monsoon, new road construction is required. And uh, another note, quality of roads is questionable. Those are the kind of things on the minds of those sitting in the room. The one thing is very correct. I fail in one mission regarding this road safety bill. It is I already have submitted from six to seven months to the cabinet. And uh, because of the parliament is not going on, I am helpless. And really, I feel it very bad. Every year, this country faces five lakh accidents, one lakh fifty thousand deaths. I am very sorry. We want to change. Now we are, as per the quality is concerned, we have decided to construct cement concrete road. So the quality will be good. But regarding the accidents, it is really painful, and I am admit, admitting this fact that today after trying my level best, I can't get success to clear this bill, and I am vigorously trying for that. But right. it is a failure, and a lot of actions are taken place. I also one of the victims, I faced a long, big accident. My secretary has also faced the accident. It's very unfortunate, but you, it needs some pressure because this is a subject in concurrent list. We need state government cooperation. And that's why the, there are a lot of big corruption is there in this RTO and other thing. The, right. the lobbies are making a post for it, but it's by public support. We will try to pass this bill as early as possible. It is Minister, delayed, thank and you. I'm admitted. Remember that ministerial apology three times, I think we heard it. Yeah. Let's move on yeah. to energy and financial inclusion. Uh, to Ratul Puri, who is chairman of Hindustan uh, Power Projects uh, for Hindustan Power. Um, the summary of what your group discussed, uh, sure. Ratul. Maybe before I get into the summary of what my group discussed, I think it's important for us to dispel one notion that I think has been going around. I've been hearing this all day, you know, as I walked around the, the, the forum events, and that is that India is energy surplus. I think uh, India certainly is not energy surplus. I think to the point uh, Minister Gutkari made earlier, I think the only reason we are energy surplus is because we have a dysfunctional intermediary. Our distribution companies are dysfunctional. They're not, uh, they're losing money on every unit of energy they buy, and hence they're not able to, they're not going out and servicing their customers. <laughs> but moving back to, um, to clean energy, I think you know, we had a very engaging set of discussions yesterday and today around what are the key enablers to drive renewable energy. 
Firstly, Government of India, I think, under our very energetic energy minister, has put together one of the world's most ambitious renewable energy build-out programs over the next five years, 175 gigawatts of renewable energy across solar, wind, and a number of other areas but between now and 2022. So, you know, we identified a number of key areas that we believe would be the key challenges in, in meeting this and um, also uh, identified possible solutions. But the key and foremost area was around the area of financing. So, you know, there was a belief that, you know, there's a need for about $150 billion of investment that needed to go in, of which $120 billion need to come in from the Indian banking system. And a belief that this, this amount of capital for this narrow vertical in the overall infra, infra and energy space was going to potentially be a challenge. Uh, what was good was, I think, Minister Goyal believed that he could get a number of uh, the financing agencies that are outside of the banking system that come under his ministry to potentially come in and help bridge some of this, uh, this financing gap. Also, there was, there was uh, uh, a belief that there was an importance to create a bond market, an ability to take assets as they were built out, to pull them out from the banking system and drive them out and place them out with insurance uh, companies, pension funds, which is exactly how infrastructure is financed in a post-construction period globally. Uh, the second area which was of concern was, uh, was around the grid and, you know, the ability of the grid to deal with what fundamentally is an intermittent form of energy. Renewables at the end of the day are not, are not base load power, they're not available all the time. The sun doesn't shine at night, the, there's, there are times when the wind doesn't blow. So we need, to, we need to have an ability in the grid, we need to have uh, spinning reserves, we need to have backup capacity to come in and be built out within this short period of five years to potentially come in and meet uh, and deal with the intermittent nature of, uh, of wind. And I think the view was we have about 25 gigawatts. Again, I think it was a, uh, it was a part of the innovative thinking of uh, uh, the energy minister that we've got 25 gigawatts of stranded gas thermal capacity, which is currently greatly challenged. And this could potentially be be revived, brought back on stream, uh, maybe supported by the government to provide some of the spinning reserves needed to, to build this out. I think the third area which I think is of uh, concern in the entire energy build out in the ability of I think the government's program to deliver 24-7 20, power supply is in the area of the distribution company financial health and uh, you know poor practices distribution companies have adopted uh, 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 of uh, having high transmission distribution losses and not revising tariffs in line with increasing costs. So I think there is also a, um, uh, a program which, um, or, 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 or a strategy that the government seems to be evolving to potentially move some of the debt of distribution companies onto the balance sheets uh, of state governments, which is actually where it needs to lie because fundamentally it's, uh, these are uh, subsidies that uh, should have originally uh, been on the balance sheets of state governments, but should have been provided by state governments. So to move some of this debt over to the balance sheets of state governments, give a clean start, and then hopefully use a number of programs from the central government to try to ensure that we don't need to go in and once again do a bailout to distribution companies a few years down the road. Thank you, Ratul. Anyone else would like to come in on, on energy, please? Keep the microphone, because I did, I think, hear uh, the finance minister say, quote, we are generating more power than we need. Help us understand what he means and what you've just described. Sure. I think the finance minister was absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have consumers who are generating power using diesel, uh, LSHS, furnace oil. We've got about 80 gig gigawatts of diesel-fired and, and other liquid fuel-fired capacity. Uh, we need that capacity because the grid is unreliable. Distribution companies are not delivering out energy because they lose roughly around 25 cents on the dollar for, for every dollar of revenue, they're losing about 25 cents. So if you're, if you're losing that much of money, you just take the position that Minister Gatkari highlighted earlier, which was, you know, I'm better off just not delivering energy out. So obviously, you'll have spare generation capacity, because if the consumer, if the, if the intermediary, the distribution company, doesn't deliver the energy out to the final consumer, you will be surplus. But I think that is something which uh, is being addressed shortly. I, I believe there's a lot of work that's gone in to try to address that. So, uh, you know, that is a, a key fix in, the, in India's uh, energy map. I think that's one of the key fixes that need to be, uh, in, in needs to be implemented out. And just before you sit down, or maybe anyone else in the power sector might like to come in, is that 175 gig 
deliverable, particularly sustainable with the new technology and the volume of PV panels and everything else, is that deliverable in this time frame? I think it's 175 gigawatts across wind and solar, out of which 100 gigawatts is solar, and I think uh, 50 odd gigawatts is wind. Uh, so I think it certainly is deliverable. The, the, the physical infrastructure can be created. You can put those many panels out. You can, you can construct that out over a roughly six year or time frame. I think, again, the challenges identified were financing. You know, we need to make certain the financing is available. We need to make certain the grid is able to absorb such a large amount of intermittent power. I mean, if and when India builds this capacity out, uh, and looking at the enthusiasm of our, of our energy minister, I have a fairly high degree of confidence it will get built out. Uh, then this will constitute 25 30% of our overall energy generation at peak, and would constitute close to 0% of our energy generation when, when the sun is not shining. Right? So we have to be able to deal with this intermittent nature of this source of energy. And so a lot needs to be done to build out spinning reserves to be able to deal with this intermittent nature. All right. Uh, thank you. The deliverability of this great aspiration, both Minister and N.K. Singh. N.K. Singh, you're the economist. Is this deliverable uh, with the enormous demands just on production for the turbines and the PV cells and so on to deliver that kind of level of, 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 of power? Well, I think that it is certainly deliverable. But I think that the reforms of the distribution system and the grid has to be an enduring. There are two types of problems. One is the problem of the stock of non-performing assets. The government's present proposal is to take some of that on the balance sheet of the state governments, allow state government, the greater Rwanda, the FRBM, to be able to borrow to meet that capacity. But I think that the two critical issues which will still need to be addressed one is a broad issue of regulatory capture. What does one do in a system like ours where electricity is in the concurrent list to deal with the problem of regulatory capture where the tariff fixation process by the regulator is a realistic one? And what is more important that what you mentioned as transmission and distribution losses, we understand is an euphemism for theft. So how does one <laughs> deal with the problem of what is euphemistically described as a transmission and distribution losses. Once realistic tariffs have been fixed for the realization of that revenue stream, which is due to the electricity board. So this is one conundrum of problems to which the government's present approach is to solve the historical problems as we begin, the, namely to solve the stock as we begin to address the issues of flow. The second more important issue which has been raised is how does one integrate alternative systems of power between renewable and non-renewable in the grid system and in real time to make that a qualitative difference and bring down the demand supply equilibrium. I totally agree with the approach that to some extent a complacency that we are surplus in terms of energy and power may be misleading because this is suppressed demand and this could be really as a result of the failure of the distribution system to be able to address and deliver the power in real time. Minister, it's not quite your area, but is this deliverable? Yes, it is deliverable. The most probably what he says is absolutely correct. The distribution, transmission, and theft is a problem. When generation, you need the PLF, good PLF. Some of the power projects, they are working on 20 PLF, 30 PLF. So we have to increase the generation capacity. And third time, the other important thing is about the distribution. I have got the solution. We are now trying in Maharashtra, but it will not appropriate to talk about it because something in the political scenario. Also, you should talk in a system by which the common people can understand, and we should not invite more criticism on it. As far as the distribution is concerned, we have to find out some solution. And without that accountability, we will never be succeed in the power sector. Because we are giving power of 100 rupees, and taking the bill of 95, 90 rupees, 10 rupees losses are there. It is continuously going on last many years. How it can be survived? Somewhere we have to take some decision. And these are very hard decision, important decision. I feel that government will uh, definitely find out some solution. All right. Well, we've got literally three or four minutes to run. Um, <coughs> let me go finally back to N.K. Singh, the economist, because I picked up from a year ago what you wrote in advance of the equivalent meeting last year. 
Uh, you wrote it publicly. India remains uh, among the most over-regulated countries in the world. A manufacturer must comply with 70 regulations and file 100 returns a year. Regulation has underpinned every discussion here. Your view, please, about the state well, of regulation. I, I think there are three important changes which have taken place since I may have written that piece last year to which you are referring to me. First, I think in terms of the average time of being able to really now start, the average time has come down dramatically from 129 days to just 27 days. Second, on the ease of doing business, the ease of doing business in the calculation index of the World Bank, we have notched up 12 decisive points on two important counts on the enforcement of contract and on the total number of permissions which are needed. Third, in terms of the index compiled by the World Economic Forum on the Global Competitiveness Index, we have registered a significant change in India becoming a more competitive economic destination than was so in the last one year. So I think we are making progress. We are making credible progress. We need to keep up this pace. Thank you very much indeed. Well, what we've tried to do is summarize a whole day of discussion, literally in the last uh, 57 minutes or so. Can I finally invite uh, Philip Brussela from the World Economic Forum to come and give uh, some final remarks? Philip Brussela. So thank you, Nick. Ladies and gentlemen, I will make it quite briefly. So first and foremost, I would like to thank you. So that means, of course, our Honorable Minister, N.K. Singh, all the issue chairs, and of course, the moderator. So please, a big hand to our start off. And forward was called closing, but now we call it take off, because this was the first National Strategy Day on India. And our purpose is to shape India's national agenda in a global context. And therefore, we identified out of the nine or ten global challenges we defined as a World Economic Forum, five major issues which we would like to address together with you here in and for India. So that was the reason why we discussed, of course, the quite important issue of agriculture, food security, job skills, education, infrastructure. Financial inclusion, quite briefly, and as well the question of energy. And it was not only a discussion, because the idea was to make it shorter, a little bit smaller, more high level, which was a great success, thanks to your participation, and always action-oriented. And all of the five different issues, we identified over this day a couple of nice projects we could launch even during this day. In terms of education, we have the existing initiative for skills in India, driven by our regional business council. But in addition, now we discussed another initiative for vocational training, starting maybe in one of the states. We have, in terms of infrastructure, great discussion in terms of urbanization. In terms of energy, hopefully the agreement with a clean energy alliance with the Indian government, and of course, in terms of financial inclusion, some projects to increase the financial inclusion for all the people here in India. In agriculture, we have successful initiatives, the new vision for agriculture with Maharashtra, and now we could invite, hopefully add, then three new states in order to improve our idea of agriculture and the new vision for agriculture. So finally, we could really come into action. And therefore, it's not a closing. It's, of course, a so-called take-off session, because we would like to start now with you, all the projects over the course of the next 12 months, and to come back in one year and see what we have achieved together, really in a public-private mindset. We have had here not only one honorable minister, but 16 so-called public figures, ministers, chief ministers, and state ministers. And you, as a private sector, which means, of course, business, but civil society, academia, and the youth. So again, thank you very much for your engagement. And of course, we owe the people in India a great success for all the projects we started. So again, thank you very much. It was a great day, and hopefully a good takeoff. Safe flights. Thank you very much. <laughs>